But when they talk about defunding the police, I, my answer is absolutely, absolutely correct. Uh, because police forces in this country, if they're not tied generally to sheriff's departments, which usually have some kind of constitutional and historical basis, are pretty much inventions. Uh, they don't have any specific constitutional foundation. The people have the authority constitutionally to take protective actions, but they have been put in this position whereby the vast majority of them have no understanding whatsoever of what their constitutional authority is, and they have no understanding whatsoever of how if that constitutional authority would be exercised, most of these problems would disappear. Let's go back to the police for one moment. I mean, if you had militia structures properly organized, you would never have a situation where any local politician dared to tell the, quote, police units within the militia to stand down when riots were going on in their communities. Mm. I can guarantee you that would never happen. That politician would be out so fast one way or the other his head would spin. The same reason that we have Bolshevism in the streets of this country is because we have a certain large segment of the political class that wants to remove the people themselves from direct involvement and direct control of the political landscape. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a distinguished returning guest. Dr. Edwin Vieira is a PhD and a constitutional attorney. He's also a writer at newswithviews.com, and he has his own books available on Amazon. We'll talk about that later. He joins us this Wednesday, August 20th, 2020. Dr. Vieira, thanks for joining us again. My pleasure to be with you. We've had you several times on in the past where you've talked to us about what is the nature of and the source of the Second Amendment rights that we are both uh, privileged to have as well as have a duty to uphold as citizens of this country. You also uh, talked with us about our innate rights as free people and the role and obligations that we have, the duties that we have to stand up for ourselves, for our families, for our communities, and you've called for sort of a renewal or a revivification of the militia as really an originating concept and a reality that was around at the beginning of our of our nation because the, the original colonies had had militia and so on. But now we're living at a time of, I don't know if it's unprecedented, but it certainly is unnerving unrest. We've had so many demonstrations that have turned into riots and looting and destruction of people's homes, of businesses, and of entire communities, you know, Minneapolis was burning, Seattle, Portland, Chicago, it's ongoing. And there's been a very startling range of response, all the way from f police forces being officially ordered to stand down and not prevent all this destruction, to sometimes in some communities like Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where the entire community basically turned out with their weapons carried openly and said, it's not going to happen in our town. And we've had a couple in Missouri that was trying to stand their ground with the feeling very threatened by a passing crowd that was on their way to do destruction. And they were very much at fear of standing up for themselves and have been basically persecuted in the courts and so on for doing that. So that's the topic we'd like to, to step into. And you usually bring great order when you throw out a topic like this, but we'd like you to bring us to clarity of understanding what are our innate rights and what are our constitutional rights when approaching these situations that seems like we're likely to be plagued with more of in this contentious election year. Well, as Richard Weaver once said, ideas have consequences. And I would simply add to that that bad ideas beget catastrophes. And we have had a couple of generations, because this goes back in my memory, of course, to the 1960s, so generation being 50, uh, 25 years, talking uh, maybe three generations mm -hmm. now, of really bad educational uh, ideas or bad educational structures, uh, control at the local level by the National Education Association, American Federation of Teachers, and then uh, various organizations all the way through the college level. 
And so they've turned out a couple of generations of uh, Bolsheviks. Basically, that's what we're facing, neo-Bolshevism. And these are people who can't think for themselves. They're enamored of Marxist ideas which they don't understand. They have no background in certainly American principles of constitutional law, Republican form of government, and so forth. And they're out there screaming and yelling and destroying on behalf of God knows what. Even they can't tell you what it is all about. And on the other side, we have some of those earlier generations have become uh, political leaders, as it were, and they're in mayoral positions or their governors or what have you in various states, California, uh, Chicago, uh, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts. You can run down the list of the usual suspects. And these are people who also don't have any understanding of their own constitutional duties, let alone uh, the authority of uh, the structure at various levels all the way up to the President of the United States. And so, as you pointed out, uh, we're having situations, at least in, in major urban areas, of uh, riot, looting, uh, assault, mm -hmm. in some instances, uh, you know, attempted murder, and maybe even murder. And the political authorities at those, those local levels are looking the other way, and for one reason or other, uh, as expression goes, playing politics with this. In some instances, the, the police have stood down, have been told to stand down, have been threatened with uh, what they call defunding, have the example of the uh, uh, police chief named uh, Carmen Best, I believe, who uh, her department was going to be suffering a significant cut in, in pay, and so she finally resigned after 30 years on that police force. She had just risen to the level of police chief. Uh, so you see that kind of thing happening. Uh, let me say something kind of pro provocative here. When they talk about defunding the police, I, my answer is absolutely, absolutely correct. Uh, because police forces in this country, if they're not tied generally to sheriff's departments, which usually have some kind of constitutional and mm -hmm. historical basis, are pretty much inventions. Uh, they don't have any specific constitutional foundation. Uh, may have some statutory foundation, obviously, but not a specific constitutional foundation. And we've had these entities created all over the country in a kind of hodgepodge fashion. So you go in any particular state, you take Virginia as an example. We have sheriff's departments because that's a constitutional entity. But we have police forces. We have county police forces. We have town police forces. We have city police forces. We have a state police uh, unit. All of these things created uh, topsy-turvy in a sense over long periods of time, with no real integration among them, no real understanding of how these things are supposed to play into the defense of the community. And that's because we have lost the concept, not the constitutional foundation, but I say the political concept of the militia structure, which is the involvement of everyone in the community from 16 on up to whenever you're physically incapable of serving, to perform some kind of police policy execution of the law's function. And if we had that kind of a structure, the first thing you would not see is police departments standing down because some political figure told them to and looking the other way while rioting and looting and so forth were going on in their communities. That would be, I think, essentially a political impossibility to occur. And on the other hand, you would not have had to have uh, private individuals such as the husband and wife out there in, I think it was St. Louis, mm -hmm. coming out to defend their property against a mob that was taunting them and threatening to burn the place down. And then having the political authority there, I think the local district attorney, uh, getting an indictment against them simply because they were exercising their natural right of self-defense. So let's go back and take a look at that historically. Natural right of self-defense you can find all the way back in Blackstone's commentaries in the 1700s. And it was understood, I think it still is by people who think about it, as the primordial right of every individual mm -hmm. to protect your own life against aggression by you know, some other party. And then that goes up to the next level of community self-defense, the right of a community to defend itself against aggression. And that's the militia concept which is the collective assertion of the right of self-defense on the part of everyone in the community. 
And that's the thing that we've essentially lost, and maybe both of them, because in many communities you find that people who attempt to defend themselves, certainly with firearms, uh, find themselves on the wrong side of some kind of uh, politically motivated investigation and possibly prosecution. And, of course, we don't have any real malicious structures functioning in this country. And it's interesting because when I talk to a lot of people in Virginia, I, I ask them that question. I say, well, what do you think about the militia? And they look at me with a, sort of the dead fish look. Mm-hmm. And I say, well, don't you realize that I'm usually talking about people who are older than 16 and younger than 55. Mm-hmm. I say, don't you realize that you are a member of the Virginia militia, the Commonwealth militia? And they look at me and say, I hadn't, no, what's that all about? And so then I recite a little bit of the statutory law to them. And I think you'll find that in almost every state that the average person, there is a statute somewhere that uh, decrees who are members of the militia, and the average person has no idea that this thing exists. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, of course, that the political figures don't want to make people aware of that, because that type of a structure puts real political as well as, if you will, paramilitary power into the hands of the average person. That's what it was designed to do. If you look at the Constitution of the United States, the three purposes for which Congress can provide for calling forth the militia. Well, repel invasions is one. That's an obvious defense of the community from external threats, external military threats. Suppress insurrections. That's against internal threats of various kinds, but insurrections usually rise to a high level of violence. And then the third one is execute the laws. Well, because execute the laws is a fairly broad area of uh, authority. It includes everything potentially that's within the laws, from police functions all the way down to some kind of social welfare functions that could be performed in local communities by people who are properly organized. And so here we have the difficulty that we have an almost professionally organized Gene Sharp. If you know about Gene Sharp, Gene Sharp wrote a number of books on what he called nonviolent uh, resistance or nonviolent overthrow of oppressive governments, however you want to put it. But the reality of it was it includes a lot of potential for violence. And we see these people using those techniques. They're very, fairly well organized. And they have a goal, which is to create as much uh, social dislocation and political chaos as they possibly can. Uh, and on the other side, we have communities that, for one reason or another, are uh, in the hands of politicians who want to play along with the game of the of the rioters and on the other hand are not uh, sufficiently organized to protect themselves because of the nature of the police forces that they have so we're kind of in a limbo situation because here the people the people have the authority constitutionally to take protective actions but they have been put in this position whereby the vast majority of them have no understanding whatsoever of what their constitutional authority is, and they have no understanding whatsoever of how that constitutional authority would be exercised, most of these problems would disappear. Let's go back to the police for one moment. I mean, if you had militia structures properly organized, you would never have a situation where any local politician dared to tell the, quote, police units within the militia to stand down when riots were going on in their communities. Mm. I can guarantee you that would never happen. That politician would be out so fast one way or the other, his head would spin. Secondly, on the other side of this coin, you would not have these incidents, and there are some of them, obviously, of police brutality that go on, mainly because the police in any locality would be drawn from people who lived in that locality. Mm -hmm. And they would have to answer, socially at least, to their neighbors for what they were doing in their role as, or their function as police executing the laws. Secondly, you'd have a very large number of alternative methods for uh, objecting to and correcting incidents of police brutality. I mean, typically what happens now is some rogue cop does something out of line and there's a hue and cry about it. It goes to the internal affairs department of the police and say, oh, that was all within procedure, no problem. And if someone takes it to the next level, which is the prosecutor, local prosecutor, the prosecutor looks at it and says, well, that was reasonable. Right? And if it somehow or other gets ends up with a grand jury indicting this cop, and they go to trial, the prosecutor and the judge throw the case. I mean, that's the reality, the way these things actually work, because they're all in it together, and they really have no ties back to the larger community. 
if you had a militia structure, that policeman would be part of a special police unit within the militia, such as the Minutemen were. You think of some of these examples from the mm-hmm. colonial period. Now, he would be in that position because you wanted specialization. But originally, he would have been a member of his own local militia unit, which was a geographical matter. And so many families, homes within a particular geography, so you get 50 to 100 people. And he will have been given an exemption from his duty there so that he could perform this special function in the police unit. So someone is harmed by this individual, have a rogue police episode. What does he do? Well, he could go to the police unit and make a complaint. He could go to the unit from which that person, that particular individual, was exempted and make a complaint. He could go to his own unit, because this fellow would also probably be a member of the military. He could go to his own unit and make a complaint. So you've got at least three, and I can probably come up with four or five, depending upon the structure that was set up in that locality, for bringing some kind of charge and causing some kind of an investigation to be held. So it would be basically impossible, as a practical matter, for these kinds of things to be covered up and whitewashed. So this whole problem of police brutality, I think, would be eliminated fairly quickly. Hmm. Because these kinds of cases would actually end up being prosecuted in some manner, and if improper behavior had occurred, then there would be appropriate punishment. You wouldn't have really the ability to have uh, a cover-up mechanism because there would be too many alternative routes for causing that particular incident to be investigated. So we'd solve that problem as well. And then thirdly, if we're talking about, say, that couple in St. Louis, well, I don't know how old they, they, those two are, but let's assume that they, they would be within the age limits of the militia. And even if they weren't, because in many states, that's a statute that says even if you're too old, you could be called forth in, a, in an emergency, and of course you'd have your right of self-defense anyway. Uh, that those people would be functioning not solely as individuals in protecting their own property. They would be functioning as members of the militia, because hmm. what were they doing? What was their argument? or will be their argument, I assume. Well, we're exercising our right of self-defense, our natural right of self-defense, which can't be taken away from us by any law of society. Well, you're talking about a law there, right? Part of the natural law. That's one of the laws of the common law. It's one of these basic principles of natural law. Self-defense was part of the common law because it was part of that natural law. Hmm. And it's part of, uh, in many state statutory law as well. They've, they've created statutory codes which embody the principles of self-defense. So here these people would have been doing what in protecting their own property? They would have been executing the law, right, against the people threatening them. Well, that's the first duty of the militia, or responsibility, or authority, whichever word you want to use, Mm. is to execute the laws. So they'd be performing a militia function. You see, so all this would tie together. Now, the reason we don't have it is the same reason that we have Bolshevism in the streets of this country. It's because we have a certain large segment of the political class that wants to remove the people themselves from direct involvement and direct control of the political landscape, if you will. And that was the ultimate purpose of the militia. And of course, that's why it was put in the Constitution of the United States. That's why you see it in the Constitution of statutes, I guess, of every state, I can't think of one that doesn't have it, was to maintain the control of the people themselves, ultimately, over the political structure. How does the Second Amendment begin? A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Stop right there, and you'll see the whole purpose of this. Maintenance of a free state, that's the goal. A free state, not a police state, not a totalitarian state, not a Marxist state not a politically correct state, whatever, a free state. And it needs security, obviously, right? defense from external enemies and internal enemies. And the well-regulated militia is the thing that the Constitution declares to be necessary for that purpose. Well, what does necessary mean? You can't do without it, right? And yet we look at the situation that we have today, and where are these, because there would be 50 of them, one in each state, where are these well-regulated militia performing functions necessary to the security of free state? The answer is, well, they're nowhere. You'll find them in the statutes. Statutes refer to these things. You'll find them in the Constitution of the United States. It certainly refers to them. 
but they're not there. And their police function, their execution of the laws function, at least on the streets, because there are other kinds of execution of the laws, that function has been taken over by these professional little standing armies, hmm. because that's essentially what they are. And they may have been created by you know, a town or a county or whatever, pursuant to some statutory authority that, that local governmental body has. But nonetheless, that's what they really are. They're separate, independent of, in many instances, antagonistic towards the communities they're supposedly serving. They're entirely professional and paid. There's absolutely no control over them by the community themselves. The only control is the possibility that some local district attorney or some local board of supervisors or whatever the governing body may be able to discipline the organization, but maybe not because they tend to be politically in bed with each other. And so they have a kind of independent existence. And as a result of that, it's kind of logical to expect that they'll be taking liberties, as it were, in their relationship to the community. And so, of course, we see that in certain elements of, of police brutality. So uh, it's not surprising that all these things have fed together because the controlling mechanism that was understood by the founding fathers, the things that were going to maintain the free state, that were going to allow the people themselves to be in control of these vital areas, they have all been shifted into a kind of limbo, practical and political limbo so that you have the statutory structure, the constitutional provisions, they're all there. And yet when you ask, well, where are the people performing these functions? The answer is, well, they're nowhere. And as a result, other things have filled the gap. All right? If you're going to execute the laws, something is going to fill the gap. Well, we have professional police to fill the gap. And here's the consequence of having professional police. After a while, they start acting like little standing armies. As soon as they start acting like little standing armies, what happens? You have that principle the Declaration of Independence execrates, that the military becomes superior to the civil power. And they begin thinking of themselves that way, the us versus them mentality, the thin blue line, mm -hmm. right? the loyalty to the, to the department as opposed to the loyalty to the community. And this isn't necessarily to denigrate those people. That's kind of a natural consequence of setting up a structure of this kind. I mean, that's why the founding fathers were desperately afraid of standing armies, because that's exactly what happens with standing armies. They begin to see themselves as separate from the community. They're responding to their own officers or maybe some king or whatever, some mm -hmm. commander-in-chief type figure, and they become extraordinarily dangerous to the freedom of, of, of society under those circumstances. So these are just little standing armies. And the reason you have them, of course, as I said before, is that the entities that were supposed to be in control have been removed. By whom? Well, by the political class. The political class has been doing this since about 1903. Go back and look at the statutes sequentially, piece by piece. And whenever they've been given an opportunity, I shouldn't say they've been given an opportunity, an opportunity has arisen where the people would say, wait a minute, we should have this structure over here. I'd take World War II. I'd love to give that as an example. Because in World War II, of course, the politicians in Washington and the military people in said, well, we're going to have to have millions of Americans go off to fight in Europe, go off to fight in Asia. Uh, who's going to be left home to uh, defend you know, home territory against all sorts of things, you know, sabotage or whatever? Uh, and the answer was, well, we don't know. Now, the, the correct answer was, well, it's the militia. Look in the Constitution. It's the militia that should be doing this. You're not going to send everyone from 16 to 60 to Europe or to Asia, you have plenty of people, if they were properly organized and trained and equipped, to perform these functions here at home. But no one bothered to look into the Constitution, so they had two luminaries of the time, Fiorello LaGuardia, who had been mayor of New York and was a congressman, and Eleanor Roosevelt. They put these two people in charge of trying to develop a home guard type situation. There's a fantastic book called Defenseless in the Night, can't think of the author of it, but that's the title, Defenseless in the Night, goes into this in great detail, the blunders of all of these people. And it's fascinating because you look at that book and you say, does he even mention militia? No. 
No one ever thought to look into the Constitution. Huh. And if they had, obviously they would have seen the solution. Congress shall have the power to call forth the militia to execute the laws, suppress insurrections, repel invasions. Well, that's perfect. That's what a, I guess what, you know, ultimately the concept, the home guard, to use a more popular term, mm-hmm. would be doing. Say. And the same thing is true today. So you look at this situation that we have now. These are, uh, constitutionally speaking, these are insurrections. And certainly they're violations of all sorts of laws. And what happens? Well, in those cities like Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, Minneapolis, Seattle, Portland, some of them in California as well, where you have uh, neo-Bolshevik, extreme uh, progressive, as they like to use that term, extreme progressive uh, politicians will essentially favorable to this, uh, to the political goal of the rioters and the looters. You have chaos. And the only thing that stands between you and chaos in those situations are the, these mini armies, the police, the professional police, and of course the neo Bolsheviks want to do what? Defund. They want to defund the police, remove the police, right? And then what happens? Then there is no organized structure left between the average person and the organized rioters. All right? And you can't even call this anarchy because there is an organizational structure, right? Antifa is an organized structure. Antifa is an organization that's funded and trained and directed in some way. So you can't even call this anarchy. That's why I call it Mm neo-Bolshevism. There's a definite organizational pattern built here. And so the average person is there and says, what can I do? That's what he's saying to himself, what can I do? Well, he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't even know what his real legal authority in this situation is. He may have some vague idea, well, I can defend myself with a firearm. But then he thinks about those two people in St. Louis. Mm-hmm. They defended themselves. And what happened? Now they're being prosecuted. Oh, I'd love to think about the, uh, the, uh, the governor there of Missouri who said, oh, well, I'll pardon them. Well, yeah, maybe you'll pardon them after they get a criminal conviction. They're two lawyers. What happens with a lawyer when he gets a you know, felony criminal conviction? He's generally just barred. Interesting question as to whether a pardon clears that up. Because all pardon says, yes, you committed the crime, but I, as the governor, I, as the president, am remitting the penalty for that. I'm pardoning you. It doesn't remove the, the conviction, generally speaking. Mm. So here we have this unfortunate situation. And I think it just goes back to the fact that people have not been paying serious attention, or maybe any attention, to the obvious structure of the Constitution. You've got these Second Amendment advocates out there whose main concern is that people should have firearms and training so that they can defend themselves as individuals against Mm -hmm. uh, essentially individual criminals or maybe one of these looting situations, but basically the adventitious criminal. Right? And they never point out that, well, now wait a minute, what, what are these people doing in that role of self-defense? And isn't there something bigger, isn't there a bigger picture here that we're missing? Could this possibly have been, could they have possibly have written in the Constitution of the United States the Second Amendment? You find amendments similar to it or provisions similar to it in the constitutions of the, of the states. Right. Could they have possibly have written those in there solely to guarantee a right of self-defense? And the answer is, well, obviously not, because it's impossible to look in the Constitution of the United States or the Constitution of any state I've ever seen and find a power in the hands of the legislature or the governor or the judiciary of the state to deny the right of self-defense. So why would you need an amendment to protect against a denial which couldn't be made? It makes no sense. Now, what makes sense is they didn't want, in the U.S. Constitution, they didn't want the states to be taking some action that could have undermined the effectiveness of their militia because their militia was subject to call by Congress. Mm. And on the other hand, they didn't want Congress to do something to undermine 
the militia, the militia being institutions of the states, because those institutions could be used by the states themselves. So it was this bipartite control that was being built in. The states weren't going to be allowed to do anything negative, and Congress wasn't going to be allowed to do anything negative, which meant that what? That that power remained in the hands of the people completely. Well, do we have that now? And the answer is no. We go to the average person. You start mentioning militia. And I've had this experience for years. Mm-hmm. And they look at you as if to say, well, you're talking about crazy people running around in the woods with AK-47 rifles. And I say, well, no, I'm not. But you know, that's the impression that they have. Where did they get that? Well, they got it from the Southern Poverty Law Center and probably some documents put out by the uh, FBI and various fusion centers around the country and so forth and so on that have been designed to, to uh, demonize this concept. Well, why would you do that? Why would you demonize a concept or an institution? It's not a concept, an actual institution. That the Constitution of the United States itself says is necessary to the security of the free state. What level of stupidity on the one hand, to give them you know, the charitable interpretation. What level of stupidity could be involved in that kind of demonization? Of course, the other side of it is, it's, it's shrewdness, it's not stupidity. They want to demonize this institution in order as much as possible to remove the people from any conception that they're actually in control of their own government. Which means somebody else is in control of their government. Because there's always control. Right? There's none of this is, you'll never see anarchy. Anarchy is an impossibility. As soon as you put two people together, one of them is going to be in control. Psychologically, at least. Hmm. There's no such thing as anarchy. But the situation we have now is, if the thing that's necessary to a free state is not there and functioning, then what sort of a state do we have? Ah, and to whose interest is that? Ah, there you go. So you can answer that question for yourselves. So here we have an example, precise example, what's going on in the streets of Seattle and Minneapolis, whatever, Portland especially, of why those provisions in the Constitution of the United States, the provisions of various states, were considered necessary by the framers and are necessary, because here's what happens. If you get the post, uh, and it's not a very large segment of the political class either, Right? So the mayor, the mayor, the mayor of one city can do this. And then the police can be told to stand out or look the other way or become, what, uh, uh, disillusioned by their, their situation and simply sit on their own hands for one reason or another. Or, you know, why should I go as a policeman into a, into a riot and risk being, uh, you know, brained with a, a rock or something and, and end up crippled? when no one's uh, backing me at the higher levels in the right. political right. or whatever, right? Okay? So, what, so we have all these elements coming together, and the people themselves standing there, not knowing what to do, having no organization, arms, most instances, training with arms, at least some of them may have guns, but they haven't been trained. They certainly have no discipline, no structure. And no understanding of their own authority, no understanding of their own responsibility, constitutionally speaking. Not just in terms of you know, self-defense, but constitutionally speaking. That if the politi- their, their po- local political figures don't take the appropriate action, they're going to take the appropriate action. They are the ultimate ones who are to execute the laws. Well, they can't possibly do that unless they've been you know, brought into the proper, uh, proper structure. You can't expect them to be able to do that. And so here's the, here's the difficulty, here's the bottom line. Okay, we've been left without the ability to defend ourselves. We have to defend, uh, depend upon uh, professional police, who for one reason or another may be unreliable. We have to depend upon local politicians, who definitely are unreliable. They've proven that over and over again. Yes. And, and they're actually uh, antagonistic towards us, because when we as individuals, such as that couple in St. Louis, attempt in an emergency situation to defend ourselves, they turn on us and, and, right. and file criminal charges. Well, I guess she's working. I don't know whether she's that local 
attorney has actually filed them as, as threatened, but nonetheless, okay, they're going to be subject to potentially subject to criminal charges. So I think this is a, a, a marvelous, in a sense, teaching moment that um, uh, Antifa and their friends have presented to us because it shows precisely what the problem is. Now, of course, it requires someone to say, ah, let's look at the problem and then let's compare it over here to the blueprint for the solution. And now we can see why this is the problem and how we have to deal with it. And there's the difficulty. There's exactly the difficulty. And that ties in, of course, to the whole business of Trump, President Trump, uh, let's say threatening, promising, depending on how, how you want to yeah. interpret what he said, that he was going to uh, you know, bring in, quote unquote, federal forces into these various municipalities to deal with them. Uh, and what his authority is. Well, what is his authority? His, he is the commander in chief of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. And when does that happen? Well, it happens when Congress, under its power to provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws, suppress insurrections, has passed some kind of statute. Because the president can't do it on his own recognizance. It depends upon congressional action. Well, Congress has passed a number of statutes. And a lot of people talk about this thing called the Insurrection Act. Well, there is no such thing called the Insurrection Act. That's actually a, a, a rubric or a title that's given in Title 10 of the United States Code. Chapter 13, I think, it is. Chapter 13 is Insurrection. All right? But there's no specific Insurrection Act. There are a number of acts that deal with insurrectionary-type events. And the one that no one seems to talk about is Title 10 of the United States Code, Section 253, 253. And I would suggest that people look that up, find that easily enough in U.S. Code, Internet, Title 10, Section 253. And what that essentially says is the president may use such of the militia or of the armed forces as necessary to suppress uh, conspiracies and so there's a whole list of terms within a state where some portion of the state's population is being deprived of privileges and immunities and equal protection of the laws under the Constitution of the United States. And the state officials who could be doing something are not, for whatever reason. Okay. And that's exactly what's hap what happened in Minneapolis. It's exactly what happened in Seattle. It's exactly what's happening in Portland every night now and in a number of other cities. There are portions of those populations there who are being deprived of privileges, immunities, rights, and so forth under the Constitution of the United States, and in many instances under the laws of the states. And the state officials are not exercising their rightful authority to correct the situation. So under those circumstances, the President of the United States can call forth the militia. Now, it's right there in the statute, for heaven's sake. Well, let's say this was happening in Virginia, because I don't know the exact laws in, out there in Minneapolis or in Portland. But in Virginia, well, he could call out the militia of the United States, so-called Title 10 of the United States Code, Section 246. And that is defined in what they call the unorganized militia, because the other portion of it is the National Guard. Let's leave the National Guard aside, because you know, those are soldiers. Nobody wants to see that kind of that kind of action. But the unorganized militia of the militia of the United States is everyone from 17 to 45. It's a pretty large group of people. And in Virginia, same title, unorganized militia of the militia of the Commonwealth of Virginia, it's everyone from 16 to 55, men and women, unless you're not able-bodied. That's a huge number of people. So the President of the United States could call out from those localities or some other locality and bring them in, God knows how many people, to solve this problem. And it would all be the result of a congressional statute, first his authority, his authority acting under a congressional statute, passed pursuant to Congress's authority. And what's interesting about Section 253 is why was it passed? Well, it was passed in 1871 to deal with the Ku Klux Klan. You had a situation in the former Confederate states in which the local officials were looking the other way 
or was sometimes directly participating, yes. in clan activities. So a man might be sitting as a justice of the peace one day, and that evening he was putting on his white robes and going out and burning a black church or whatever, trying to suppress the, the freedmen in the exercise of their constitutional rights. And nothing was being done about that by the local authorities, right? Looting, rioting, killing, and nothing was being done by the local authorities. So they passed this statute in 1871, pursuant to the 14th Amendment, in order to give the president the authority to intervene in those situations. Well, that's exactly what's going on in these cities. There are segments of the population that are being subject to rioting, to looting, to attempted murder, to arson. Yeah run down the list of crimes, the state officials are doing nothing, or they're doing something negative because they're telling the police to stand down. Right. Or at least they're discouraging the police from taking the appropriate action. And so the victims are being deprived, nightly in Portland, of various constitutional rights, privileges, and immunities. And the state officials are doing nothing, or they're actually contributing to this. I think in contributing to it is a better description. So the president, there's no question, the president of the United States, whoever he was, it's not just a matter of Donald Trump, whoever he was, would have the unquestionable authority to go in and use the militia. And I would think that he would have the unquestionable authority to say, well, I'm going to call on 5,000 people, armed people, from this area, and here's the documentation. I'm going to send some people down there to organize them properly, and you local people are going to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. You're going to patrol the streets of Portland. Anyone comes out after a certain time at night, you arrest them immediately. We'll have buses to take them away somewhere where they can be processed for violation of federal law, by the way. All right. Not worry about some state prosecutor doing these. will all be federal violations. So I look at that and I say, well, wait a minute. That situation. And, and they're criticizing him. Leave aside you know, his personality, but they're criticizing him as if he were making some sort of dictatorial uh, pronouncements when the statutes are right there. Right. And they would be enforced. I mean, he could enforce them this way. They would be enforced calling upon whom? The people themselves in the militia. That's the exact word that's used in those statutes, the militia. So... As I say, here we have a fantastic teaching moment. If someone <laughs> would once get control of, I don't know, Google or YouTube or whatever, uh, Twitter, you don't get enough space, uh, in order to lay this out in front of people and say, here's why you have this problem. You have this problem because ultimately you people are not taking control of your own local problems. And that's because the politicians at all levels state and federal, have attempted to, uh, how should I say, excise you from the constitutional structure. Now, they haven't succeeded because the Second Amendment or Article 1, Section 13, the Virginia Constitution, whatever, you can go down all these state constitutions, those provisions are still there, and you'll find in the body of constitutions or the statutes in various states, provisions dealing with the militia. Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16 of the U.S. Constitution, that's some of the statutes I just mentioned while we were talking about the, the rioting, uh, definitions of the militia and, and all of the various state codes, state statutory codes, that's all there. So it's not as if we're talking about something that's imaginary or visionary. It's all there. It's that the politicians are, in a sense, keeping this from people. I mean, I'm wondering why, and we, we, I'm, we certainly won't hear this, I'm wondering why the Republican Party, certainly not the Democrats, but the Republican Party wouldn't make this part of their right. platform. Right. Say, we have this problem because of this over here, and we're going to take appropriate steps to deal with this. No, no, they're not going to talk about it at all. Well, that's because the Republican Party is really no different from the Democratic Party. They don't want the people in control of this country. They've got a nice thing going that the political parties and the guys behind the scenes that are funding them are the ones in control. And they drag the people out every two, four, 
six years, whatever it is, an election schedule, to cast meaningless votes because the candidates are put up by the machine. They're like the Stalin ballot. And on the Stalin ballot, you only had one list. Now right. you have two lists, right? But the same basic idea. Stalin controlled who was on those lists. And the political machines control who are on the list. And that's what you have. You don't have the people actually in control. And there's only one way that the people are actually in control. And unfortunately, it was Mao Zedong who, who coined the most famous aphorism. Political power comes out of the barrel of a gun. The people that control force in society are the sovereigns. Founding fathers understood this perfectly well. That's why they didn't give guns to slaves. All right? And the first batch and incident of slavery was disarmament. Uh-huh. You don't have a gun, right? Because otherwise you'd be, you'd be capable of exercising some kind of power and political power, ultimately. Right? So our Constitution recognizes the opposite of, of slavery. Recognizes the concept that you can't have a free state unless the people are thoroughly, totally armed. Because that's what a militia is. It's everyone who's capable of being armed. As soon as you become more than an adolescent, which is typically 15 or 16 years old, 16 years old now in most places, up to the point at which you're physically incapable of doing it. If you're not a conscious objector, the definition of a militia is you are armed, organized, trained, and disciplined within a particular structure to perform that function, becoming the security element of the, of the free state, the delivery of security to the free state. And when you're doing that, who's exercising the sovereignty where you are? You're in control. Why? Because you have the ultimate source of political power in your own hands. Now, they couldn't, the, the people who want to run this country couldn't come back to the average American and say, oh, well, we don't want you to have political power. That wouldn't have gone over very well. So they took a more, a more devious approach, and that was, well, we're going to remove this militia structure. We'll make that moribund. And we can get away with it because a lot of people didn't want to engage in the... Right. You know, the process. It's, it was a pain, basically a pain in the neck. That's right. right. Fulfilling, okay. fulfilling your civic duty uh, takes yeah, a lot of right. effort. That's why a lot of people don't come out to vote. Right? Who cares? I don't care about this one way or the other. Although that should be a civic duty as well. Right? Because how do you run a quote-unquote democracy unless the, the, the demos, the people, are performing that kind of a function, choosing the, you know, choosing the leaders? But anyway, that was, a, that was the way they got away with it, because a lot of people were perfectly willing not to perform these functions because they thought they had better things to do. And the reality is they don't have better things to do. Maybe you can get away with this for a generation, but eventually it catches up again. Now it's caught up with us. As I said, this thing started in 1903. The statute was passed in 1903. It was the beginning of this process of phasing out the militia. And now we're seeing the consequences of it. It took a while, but you know, ideas have consequences. So there's the difficulty. They remove people from the militia structure surreptitiously by playing on uh, essentially sloth. Mm-hmm. If they want to expend the effort. Yep. And then the next step is what? Well, remove guns from their hands. See, the people still have guns. They still have the guns, and they still have these statutes and these constitutional provisions which talk about their participation in the militia. We fooled them about those provisions in the Constitution and statutes. So they don't pay attention to that anymore. We've created a lot of propaganda out there to demonize the word militia, but we still have people with guns. So what's the next obvious step? Gun control. Let's take the guns away from people. So even those two people in St. Louis wouldn't have been able to defend themselves against the mob. Because they weren't standing out there as members of the militia. Uh, they probably had no idea what the militia is, even though they're both lawyers. They were standing out there as people simply trying to defend themselves with firearms, exercise the natural law of self-defense, and they find themselves being prosecuted. So that's the next step. Why are they going after, I mean, I think of this NRA thing that's now going on, not that I'm a great proponent of the NRA in particular. But what's the ultimate goal of that, that AG's office in New York in attacking the uh, like I say, calling it corruption, upper level corruption by NRA officials in that organization. Well, it's not to correct the corruption. It's not to remove Wayne LaPierre and some of these other people from their positions of authority because they've misspent funds or whatever they're alleged to have done. It's to destroy the organization. 
And what is that purpose of that organization? Well, it's training people in arms. 1871, 1873, whenever it was formed. That was its major purpose. And its own bylaws talk about the necessity of training people so they can perform their functions in the militia. I think that's bylaw number two or whatever. So that's what this is aimed at. Here's this huge organization, four or five million members, whatever it is, been around for 150 years, 140 years. And they're trying to dissolve it. Why? Well, so there'll be no organized structure promoting firearms, ownership, and training, even for private persons, let alone for the real militia. Uh-huh. You can see the things. all very sequential is how this is going. And then, of course, what will happen if the, if the uh, anarchist group takes over, just as with, you know, with Lenin and his Bolsheviks, uh, they got rid of the Okrana, they got rid of the Tsarist police, and then they put in a worse form of police, the Cheka. OGPU, NKVD, all right, whatever you name they were using over various periods of time. You're not going to have, if these people were to get into control, you would not have a defund the police movement right. going any longer. They would be spending even more on certain kinds of police because they would be setting up a police state. Here we have a bunch of incompetent police in many instances, or sometimes police who are out of control, little standing armies, but they don't claim to be. And they're not held up by the politicians to be the arm of a police state. Oh, well, you get the Bolsheviks in, that's exactly what's going to happen. And what would be the only defense to that? Well, it would be the armed population. It would be the militia structure. I mean, leave the army aside for the moment, right? I think that's the last thing you probably want is the actual army taking over, the standing army controlling things. Uh-huh. But at the local and the state level, if you had this conflict... Who would be the only people that would be capable of resisting? And you bring up Coeur d'Alene, uh, Idaho. Yes. That's the example. I guess there was a rumor that there was to be a BLM, Black Lives Matter, march or something, demonstration, and to make sure that it didn't become um, violent, didn't result in Main Street being looted. I saw the picture. There must have been hundreds of people there. Yes. Could have been the whole population of Coeur d'Alene. And they were all out there armed and very peaceful. An armed society is a peaceful society, is the old expression. Now, the problem was with that, it was uh, adventitious. It was just a bunch of people coming out. Well, we're going to protect our community, kind of a basic concept. But how? Who was in charge of this? What real authority did we have? What was the relationship between us and those, sometimes the police that you would see being interviewed or being talked to on the street? Right. What was the relationship there? And that's where this whole thing becomes fuzzy. What is the role of the police in this situation? Which side are they going to be on? Hmm. Well, why should, they, why should there be a question of sides here? Why should the police be in a position where they might turn against the people? If it were the militia, you'd never have the police function turning against the people because it would be part of the people's entire defense structure. And so we've created these, I don't know, little Frankenstein's monsters here. These almost insoluble problems simply because they didn't follow the constitutional blueprint. Right? They, 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 they had a plane that had a blueprint that said, well, the plane has to have two wings. And over the years, they well, we cut this one down a little bit, and we cut this one down a little bit, and cut the same one down. And pretty soon we find that we have only one wing, and we're wondering why the thing crashes on takeoff. Because the blueprint's not being followed. You can't have, according to this directive in the Second Amendment, or Article 1, Section 13 of the Constitution of Virginia, and go down the list of these constitutions, you can't have a free state without a well regulated militia. That's the point. And the free state being everything else okay. that follows in the Constitution, a structure of this kind that operates with these kinds of governmental establishments, these kinds of governmental powers, these kinds of governmental limitations, these kinds of personal rights. You can't have that kind of a structure unless the ultimate power is in the hands of the sovereign, and the sovereign being the people. Otherwise, something's going to go wrong. Right. One of the pillars, structural pillars, if you remove it, 
the building is going to be unsound. Eventually, it's going to collapse. And lo and behold, here we are. One doesn't need to be a Harvard-trained lawyer to figure this out. You look at any structure as, as well thought through as the Constitution of the United States, and you see why everything has to be there, and everything has to function a certain way. And what are the three most important words in the Constitution? We the people. We the people. Right? Everything else flows from we the people. If it hadn't been we the people doing this, it wouldn't be there. And so we the people ordained and established certain things, certain structures, certain procedures and, and practices and limitations, and then in the original Constitution, and then we added to them right away in the Bill of Rights. And it's interesting that the Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment, the Second Amendment is, you know, people look at that as if that's somehow separate from everything else. It isn't. Mm -hmm. It was there, all of, all of the Bill of Rights actually, is there to prevent misconstruction or abuse of the original Constitution. There's a preamble to the Bill of Rights, which most people have never even heard of, and certainly haven't read, which says that. We're sending this thing out, we the, the people who wrote this, Congress, we're sending this out to the states for ratification. Here's our purpose. We want to prevent misconstruction or abuse of the Constitution. Well, misconstruction is a mistake, right? We misinterpret it. Abuse is something that's intentional. Uh, we want to prevent both of those. So all the Bill of Rights, you really have to look back into the Constitution and say, well, what is this directed to? What are they worried about here? And the Second Amendment talks about the militia, where you go back to the militia provisions of the original Constitution. Congress calling forth the militia, etc., the president being the commander-in-chief. So the Second Amendment is designed to make sure that those provisions are going to be properly applied, construed and applied, and not only with respect to Congress and the president, but with respect to the states, because the, the entities that are involved are these things called the militia of the several states. They're not creations of Congress. So there's a fundamental structural element within this system, which ties back into the concept that's stated at the beginning of the preamble, we the people. It's the same bloody people we're talking about. It's the we the people that are ordained and established the Constitution. It's the we the people that formed the militias of the well, there were 14 states probably by that time. Vermont had become a state, but certainly the original 13 states. Those are the people they were talking about. And, of course, then the people today, right? because we the people are in a position to disestablish the Constitution, amend it, or whatever. We have all, all sorts of power. Right? And we're the same ones that are supposed to be exercising this ultimate sovereign authority, even if it's in co-ed. I mean, you can imagine a situation where you wouldn't need to do anything you might have militia structures set up in which everyone was a member, but the only people who were really active were the ones in the police units, in the fire and rescue units, you know, like the Minutemen. That was typically the situation. The Minutemen were always coming out to be trained, and the average militiaman would come out three or four times a year, if, if that. So you might have that kind of situation. Everything would be, especially copacetic, everything would be fine. We'd have social calm, and et cetera. But the structure would still be there and ready to be utilized, expanded, if you will, in terms of participation if difficult situations arose. World War II, I'll give you that example once again. World War II comes along. If people had been properly organized, armed, trained, there would be no question as to how this was going to be done. In fact, there would probably, long before then, there probably would have been home guard type units that would have been training for the possibility of this occurring. And certainly there would have been units, or there would be units today if you had a proper organized militia structure, that would deal with the possibility of urban rioting. We've had a lot of urban rioting in this country okay. in my lifetime. Right? And it always falls back on that same initial, what do we do? Well, we call it the local police, and then it gets out of hand, and then what's the next thing we do? we got to call in the governor. No, wrong. That kind of ad hoc thinking is lead you down a you know, rat and become a you know, rat hole. This all would have been planned for. And of course, I said before, which I think is the key factor, it's the political class that have done this to us. They've taken advantage of the willingness of people to slough off their responsibilities mm -hmm. when their responsibilities become somewhat onerous. Yep. So here we're faced with this 
peak, at least it's it's a palpable and perceptible increase in the civil unrest and a increase in the level of concern of people who are paying attention. Some people would say it's it's too late. This deconstruction has gone too far. We can't reclaim it. What's the message to people who are paying attention or are concerned and do want to do something about it, first of all, in their own lives, and second of all, in their communities in our country? This interview with Dr. Edwin Vieira is to be continued in a future episode. Stay tuned. If you've decided that now is the right time for you to protect your family's financial future by acquiring physical precious metals, gold and silver, I'm delighted to let you know that I have now become a licensed dealer's representative for Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in bullion dealerships. And we can provide you with physical delivery to your personal possession or to professional vault storage or precious metals IRAs. Just email me at Liberty and Finance at protonmail.com and please include your name and phone number in your email to Liberty and Finance at protonmail.com. We'll get right back with you and find out how to best meet your needs so that you can either begin or increase your acquisition of physical precious metals now and protect your family's future starting today.